Okay, so let's take a look at another one of our elements of uh, mens rea, and that's recklessness. And I'm pretty certain that this is likely to be a relatively short video because it's a quite a simple concept to understand. And I'll start by going up to uh, my liability equation, the way in which I sort of start most of the mens rea and actus reus videos. And if you recall, we said that uh, we have to show in the first instance that actus reus is present. And then once we have shown actus reus, we look to see whether or not the, the defendant has the specific mens rea. And um, that could be mens rea or strict liability. And we'll deal with strict liability in a different um, video. And then we go to say, is there a defense before we can construct criminal liability? So, when we spoke about mens rea last week, we said that there are two sorts, didn't we? We said that there is uh, intention, and intention can be split into either direct or indirect. And remember, indirect is also known as oblique intention, so it can be named either one of those things. And we also said that there is recklessness. Um, and these are the ones that we are using, of course. And if you also remember, we sort of put them on a scale, didn't we? And we said at one end, where you had direct intention, and the other end you had strict liability, you had indirect and recklessness on that same scale. And the idea is, is that at this end of the scale, it's more blameworthy, so there's more blame attached to direct intention, the absolute meaning to go out and do something, and there's and this goes down to less blameworthy this way. And recklessness fits below direct and indirect intention. It is a less blameworthy form of mens rea than direct or indirect intention. And that's what we're going to spend the time looking at today. And we are. Um, there's one key phrase that I want you to be able to say immediately when you are asked about recklessness. And the definition of recklessness that we are going to use, and that is used, is that a defendant knows, um, so he knows there is a risk, um, but goes ahead and takes it anyway all right so that's our definition of uh, of recklessness the defendant knows there is a risk but goes ahead and takes it anyway so there are some other key elements that we need to talk about before we look at uh, our key case and there's a main case and in this video i'm going to focus on recklessness as it applies to non-fatal offenses against the person I will do a much fuller video on recklessness, which looks at all of the cases. It will look at Coldwell recklessness, it will look at Cunningham recklessness, and it will look at the decision in RVG. But I will do that later. I won't um, do that in this. In this video, I'm just going to concentrate solely on recklessness as it applies to non-fatal offences against the person. And in that sense, the recklessness that we are going to talk about is known as subjective recklessness. Now, the difference between subjectivity and objectivity are key for lawyers. We have to know what the difference is because that difference is applied in so many different circumstances. Objective deals with what the reasonable man thinks, what everybody looking at a situation would think about that situation. Subjective means what the individual thinks about that situation. And what I do to try and help my students is I use the analogy of a football match. And if you can imagine a football team has played badly on a Saturday afternoon, frequently you will see the football manager coming on TV on Match of the Day or on Sky Sports after the match and seeming to be quite blind and saying that his team played well, that the fault of losing was the referee or the wet grass or the crowd weren't behind them. That is a subjective view. Everybody else in the country that watched that football game who saw that team play dreadfully will say the team lost because they played dreadfully. All of those people and the view of those people is the objective view. The single view of the manager is a subjective view. 
So I've used this sort of um, cheesy picture here to give you an idea about that. The cat looks in the mirror and thinks that it's a lion. The subjective view of the cat is that it is a lion. The objective view, so all of us looking at that photograph who are not the cat, know that the cat's a cat. So, sorry and apologies for the cheesy video, but it helps you to understand the difference between subjective and objectivity. Okay, so that means if recklessness is subjective in this sense, it means that we have to look into the defendant's mind before we can say whether or not they were reckless. It's not whether or not the rest of us think that their actions were reckless, it's whether the defendant thinks that his actions were reckless. And the key case that we're going to use for this is R.V. Cunningham. And R.V. Cunningham is quite a humorous story. Effectively, Mr. Cunningham goes to stay with his future mother-in-law. And his future mother-in-law lives in a, a, a premises in which it was converted into two, two different houses, two different flats houses. And what Cunningham does is goes into the cellar of the next door neighbour to his future mother-in-law and steals cash from the gas meter. By doing so, he damages the gas meter. That causes gas to leak into the next door neighbour's house, making her poorly. He was charged with um, the administering of a noxious substance under the Offence Against the Person Act, and the concept of recklessness and intent came up at the trial. And in the trial, the court suggested that the correct test is whether the defendant foresaw that the removal of the gas meter might cause injury to someone, but nevertheless removed it anyway. And they said a second thing. They also said that even if the defendant did not intend the injury to the victim, it would still be deemed to be reckless. Now, what do they mean by that? They mean that the word maliciously in a statutory crime means foresight of consequence. It does not mean wicked. It can either be an actual intention to do the particular kind of harm or recklessness, whether such harm should occur. So, or recklessness, whether such harm should occur. It does not require any ill will towards the person injured. So that gives us a number of uh, uh, key things that we need to take from Cunningham before understanding. The first is, is that we are talking about subjective recklessness. And sometimes it is known and can be referred to as Cunningham Reckless. Both of those names and labels are absolutely fine. D knows there's a risk, okay? He's willing to take that risk and then takes it deliberately. And that fits with our earlier definition, if you remember, is that the defendant knows that the risk exists and goes on to take it anyway. All right, so it's not limited to ill will. So you don't have to have ill will towards the victim at all. And so it doesn't require specific ill will towards the person injured. All that you require is that there was a, a identified risk that the defendant, don't forget, it's subjective, so that the defendant recognises there's a risk and goes on to take it anyway. Now, one of the things that we have to do is that, and, and as students of law, is that we have to be able to correctly identify between what is reckless and what is oblique intent. Well, I've sort of got these all the way around, haven't I? What is reckless and what is oblique intent. And it's relatively straightforward. Oblique intent still carries with it an absolute intention to carry out some crime. And by carrying out that crime, it is virtually certain that the outcome will result, whatever the outcome might be. So there is a higher level of intent in oblique intent. Recklessness is much more like being careless. You know that if you do that, something wrong might go, might happen and you go on to continue to do it anyway. So you've got to be very, very clear when you are looking at men, a problem that involves an issue of mens rea as to make sure that you get the difference between reckless and oblique intent right. And I just want to spend just two minutes, just very, very quickly, making sure that you understand how to differentiate between oblique intent and um, 
direct intent. And that's to ask two key questions is the easiest way to do that. So the first is, what was D trying to achieve? All right. So the first question is, what was the defendant, what was defendant trying to achieve? All right. So, and by that, I mean, if the answer is the same as the result or the consequence, then it is an issue of direct intention. And that should be straightforward to establish liability. If the answer is something other than the result or consequence, then we turn to oblique intent. And then we have to answer, was the result or consequence, um, so was the result an inevitable, was the result an inevitable consequence, I think I'm going to spell this wrong, consequence, sorry, try to fit that in, was it an inevitable consequence of achieving his primary purpose? So if, if you remember, we looked at the bomb on the plane, the, in, the result, is the result, which is the plane crashing and a hundred people dying, is that an inevitable consequence of achieving the primary purpose, which is to blow up the, the, the aeroplane to destroy the parcel to get the insurance money? Of course, the answer is yes. So if you find that that is the case, then it is likely to be oblique intent and you use the virtual certainty test from Woolen and Matthews and Elaine. All right. So just make sure that you can distinguish between what is reckless and what is oblique intent and also what is oblique intent and what is direct intent. And the way that you do oblique intent and direct is what was the defendant trying to achieve and was the result an inevitable consequence of achieving his primary purpose. Now, lastly, the last thing that I just want to look at is the notion of basic and specific intent crimes. We can split almost all crimes into either basic or specific intent. And I put this on this slide, and again, I will do a specific video just on basic and specific intent crimes. But I put it in this video because reckless is the key to distinguishing between basic and specific intent. A specific intent crime is one in which intention is the only form of mens rea that is required. So the only form of mens rea that you can have is direct or indirect intent. Simple as that. Nothing else will do. And examples of that are murder, section 18, which is, you know, grievous bodily harm with intent to do grievous bodily harm, theft, oh look, I left a T off there, theft, burglary and robbery. Now, on the other hand, a basic intent crime is one in which you can have direct, indirect, or recklessness. And examples of that are involuntary manslaughter, section 20 of the Offences Against the Person Act, assault and battery. And it's important that you know a, what is the difference between a specific and basic intent crime and what makes a specific intent crime and what makes a basic intent crime? Because the availability of a defence often depends on whether the crime is one of basic or specific. OK, and the distinction, as we've seen, is one of intent. What is the intent in the two different ideas and notions? Most crimes are basic intent. That is, reckless can be um, used as a form of mens rea. For those offences, either recklessness or intention is sufficient. Now, as I've said, I will do a full video on basic and specific intent crimes. Um, it, well, I'll do a separate video on that. But I just wanted you to be aware that we're putting it on this one too. We're mentioning it on this one because reckless is the key difference between specific intent and basic intent. OK, so I've probably taken longer than I actually needed to, but I hope that's pretty much covered everything that you needed to know about recklessness. And remember, this video has covered recklessness for non-fatal offences against the person.